retirement in June. This project interested me because of my coursework in health policy and public health as an undergraduate. I really saw it as a great way to combine my interest in policy while learning about trends that are happening in medical libraries. This was also a really great project to take on while living and working in the DC area. Um, similarly, it was, it's been an interesting time to track legislation. We have a new Congress and a new administration, which have new priorities. So I was interested in seeing how these developed throughout the past couple months um, through legislation. So for the daily tasks of my project, I used a subscription service called CQ Roll Call to create six search strategies on topics that included data policy, public access, copyright, disaster medicine, and electronic health records and health information technology. I set up daily alerts for new legislation and identified bills that NLM should be following. And I supplemented CQ with some free resources that included congress.gov and GovTrack. In addition to uh, tracking policy um, and legislation, there were some other opportunities to get involved with policy. I attended the joint MLA and OGLE, or American Association of Health Sciences Libraries, um, legislative task force. Uh, they had a meeting the day before they met, before they made Hill visits, and I was able to attend and hear their policy briefing. I also summarized bills for the NLM legislative update that was given by Betsy Humphreys at MLA this past May and um, prepared legislative summaries for the NLM Board of Regents May and September meetings. These uh, summaries of bills were shared with the Board of Regents members as well as NLM staff. So overall, this project has been a great way to hone my searching skills, to learn about policy issues, and how they impact medical libraries at NLM. It's really given me much more perspective about the policy environment that we're working. My second project is the PubMed Training Needs Assessment of Cancer Researchers. And the goals of my project were to identify cancer researchers' top tasks when searching PubMed and developing and prioritizing training objectives for this group. I worked with members of NOM's PubMed training team to identify a group of interest. And I chose cancer researchers as my target population um, and specifically focused on researchers and fellows at the National Cancer Institute here on NIH campus. I started my project by reviewing the literature and having conversations with librarians who work with cancer researchers at several different libraries. My original goal was to hold one focus group, but after having um, several groups at NCI being receptive to my project and to scheduling focus groups with me, I went with the option of holding three. Um, so the three focus groups that I held were with the Hematology Oncology Fellows, or the clinical group, the Cancer Prevention Fellows, which are a um, behavioral and social science group, and researchers at NCI Frederick, and these were my basic science group. Um, then after the focus groups, I reviewed what we had learned and sent out some fo sent uh, follow-up questions to participants based on that quick analysis. So some of the results include um, some top tasks. Things that I saw these researchers doing across all three groups um, in relation to PubMed is that they often come to PubMed to search for a particular author or look for a particular article or citation. And at the beginning of their projects, they often come to see if anyone has done the research before, and if so, what has already been done. Some of the common frustrations that they have with PubMed included um, not seeing, not receiving relevant saved search alerts, and sometimes having difficulty in finding the author that they want to look up because of similar names, um, and also not being completely sure how to formulate searches in PubMed. Uh, Boolean operators, operators were mentioned, as well as not understanding what parentheses and brackets were used for. So my results are forthcoming, 
Um, I'm currently working on developing learning objectives that are based on these top tasks and frustrations. And these could be used by the PubMed trainers to frame training around the researchers' areas of weakness. Um, so just for an example, um, we know that clinicians from my particular focus group um, expressed frustration that their saved search alerts yielded a lot of irrelevant articles. Um, so perhaps we could offer training marketed as strategies to improve your alerts that also includes a brief section on how to develop and test relevant search strategies to improve them. Um, so as I said, the PubMed trainers will be able to take these recommendations to inform um, both future training efforts and future efforts at needs assessments. Um, so now I will hand off to Tyler, who will be sharing what she's been working on. Thank you, Megan. Hello, my name is Tyler Moses, and as Tony mentioned, I am one of the other associate fellows in this year's cohort. My academic background, as Tony mentioned, is lies in as well in an MLS as well as an S in health studies. This has really influenced my the development of my professional interests in creating self-sustaining outreach for families with with, with varying needs as well as connecting individuals with credible health information in order to help them make better health decisions. So I chose my two spring projects, the information needs at the Children's Inn and the email campaign to promote Medline Plus, for they both represented an opportunity for me to learn how, um, how to connect individuals to, to health information. Also, my experiences here at NLM drove me to select projects that would help me learn how medical librarians are redefining the type of outreach services that they can provide. So to provide a little inf background information, the Children's Inn is a hospitality hospital where children with rare or undiagnosed diseases and their families stay while they're participating in clinical trials here at the clinical center. To learn more information about the Children's Inn, Tony is going to be dropping a link to it in the chat box. So because of the fact that many of these children are coming in with rare and undiagnosed conditions, a lot of the families struggle with finding credible health information. So this frustration has led to for the staff at the Children's Inn to put forth a, pro, a project proposal to create a new information tool that will help connect families to credible health information. My involvement in the project lied within finding out what are the information needs of both the families as well as the patients. Through inter, so in order to find out what these needs are, I conducted interviews with, with several different groups, including families, patients, staff at the, at the Children's Inn, as well as social workers from the clinical center who, are, who work with the families close in providing them health information resources. Also, I held a focus group that included fa several family members, including an international family. And through, this, through these two processes, I had learned of some of the, some of the frustrations that families have with looking for information, as well as the type of information that they seek. Some of the things I learned including, included the type of lifestyle choices such as nutrition and exercise that they can make to help keep their children healthy. Also, families turn to medical literature in order to find information about their children's condition, but they may be the only resources that actually have information. However, a lot of the families struggle with understanding the content because of the medical jargon. Also, families are interested in establishing social networks amongst one, one another in order to share their experiences of going through clinical trials, as well as to, hope, uh, as to hopefully share resources amongst themselves. The project really gave me the opportunity to lay the foundation to create a new information tool. And it also, for me, opened the possibility of cross-collaboration between NLM, the Children's Inn, as well as possibly staff members at the clinical center. So my other project um, with the Medline Plus team included 
with finding out what email marketing strategies are, can be best employed to help connect subscribers. So Medline Plus is a website developed here at NLM that helps provide health information to, on various, such as various topics and medication to the public. Um, do you, as like many health websites, that people can subscribe to receive updates on a particular health topic that interests them. To date, Medline Plus, as well as their sister site, Medline Plus in Espanol, has over 79.9 million subscribers. Due to the large number of subscribers, the staff at Medline Plus really want to learn what improvements they can make to their emails in order to help better engage their subscribers. So as, as, I, as earlier I mentioned, the goal was really to, to uncover what email marketing strategies would best work for the Medline Plus subscribers. This project gave me the opportunity to explore email marketing tool called Gov Delivery, which has now been renamed Granicus, and also participate in web, workshops and webinars about email marketing. One such opportunity was the Granicus Digital Summit where presenters discussed what marketing strategies work for them in engaging with subscribers, and also what features the Granicus offers that can help institutions best assess how to engage with their subscribers across various platforms. In order to identify what, what, email, what particular elements of an email would best engage subscribers, I took some of the knowledge that I've acquired through the webinars as well as workshops to develop email mock-ups of two types of emails, one for a customized email and another was for newsletters. With, the, with these, these two types of emails, uh, I worked with Kate Masterton, Katie Chan, and Joanna Weiser to conduct a hallway usability test where we, we stopped random participants at the, at the clinical center to ask them to provide feedback on the mock-ups. These help, these help to identify what elements the participants have really found engaging. Along with that, I also created several customized emails that were disseminated to various subscriber groups through, through Granicus and used both Granicus as well as Google Analytics to assess how engaged the subscribers were with the emails. So, so some of the data from these, from, these, from these two experiments show that users are, real, are more likely to open an email that have a statement subject heading also, they feel that newsletter emails should contain more information versus a customized email, and also they prefer to, to click on links that actually connect to new information. This project really gave me the opportunity to learn about what makes an engaging email, and also it, for the Medline Plus staff, it really helped them identify what elements they can use in, the, in their emails to better engage their subscribers. And as a result, they're considering of incorporating a customized email design that will be disseminated to subscribers. So, and now I'm going to pass the ball over to Candace. Okay, thanks, Tyler. Uh, good afternoon. For my spring projects, I chose two opportunities that were proposed by the Lister Hill Center at NLM. The first is investigating the impact of NLM resources using bibliometric analysis. And the second is enhancing safety and case reports search filters applied in Medline to support PubMed literature alerts for pharmacovigilance. So I chose the NLM resource impact project for several reasons. First, this project was a great way to learn about more of the products and tools that NLM offers. During the curriculum phase of the program, we get a fantastic introduction to many of these products, but this project really allowed me to explore further. Second, because this project involved some bibliometric analysis, I could get experience searching databases and learning different tools that I had not used before. And third, I chose this project because I was curious if bibliometric analysis could be used to help determine product impact. This really became the most interesting part of the work as trying to define impact for a product was a real challenge. Librarians have come up with some great ways to measure the impact of instruction sessions and training programs, and the same for research impact librarians whose work shows that citation analysis alone is not enough to determine an author's impact. I wanted to see what could be done by searching the published literature to trace the impact of an NLM product, or if it was even possible. And so that's 
the big picture of this project and to get into a little bit more detail about it, um, the investigation began with a search of all 294 NLM products in PubMed to find out how researchers are referencing our tools in their work. What we found is that many resources are not mentioned explicitly by name, and while many products have such a general name, like gene or embryo, it's hard to tell if the researchers were talking about us and our products. So in order to narrow our focus a little bit, my project sponsor and I chose to focus on five resources that are representative of the types of tools that NLM has to offer. The specific products are listed on the slide. Um, and for each of those five resources, uh, I then searched across five different databases, um, which are also listed. After collecting the results for each resource, uh, data extraction focused on the type of institution producing the research, the country where the work was done, and how the product was used. From there, a portion of the total results were reviewed in full text to try to determine impact. The question of how we're choosing to define impact has shifted over the course of the project, starting with who has benefited from this new research that was completed using NLM products, and has since morphed into something closer to could this research have been done without our project products. Um, the final results are forthcoming, but so far it's safe to say that I'm intrigued by the direction that things are heading. My second project, uh, at its core, was an opportunity to review and enhance search filters used in a mediated search service to support regulatory review teams at FDA. I chose this project because it builds on my background of working in pharmaceutical research and would allow me to work closely with an embedded librarian from NLM who works in conjunction with folks over at FDA. This project is also interesting for me as it's a challenge to find the best way to locate materials in the pre-indexed portion of Medline, and that's really where the filters um, that I was looking at are focused. So for this project, uh, I was able to review two of the search filters that are currently in use at FDA, one for safety and one for case reports. And so for the safety filter, I compared the terms used in the current FDA filter with adverse events search filters published by Sue Golder in 2012. This comparison revealed two candidate phrases that can be considered for addition to the FDA filter. Preliminary testing shows that the phrases add unique results to those retrieved by the current filter, but a full retrieval analysis will be needed to show how relevant those unique results are. For the case reports exploration, I started with the case reports filter that's being used right now in the weekly alerts and ran a series of searches in PubMed to identify additional terms that can help locate case reports when the phrase case reports or case studies um, aren't explicitly named in the title abstract or the publication type case reports isn't applied to the record. Uh, through these searches, I located several phrases that can also be considered for addition to the case reports filter. And again, a full retrieval analysis will be needed uh, to determine how relevant those results are. But overall, I'm pretty pleased with being able to make a few suggestions for their consideration. Uh, and so now, I'm going to pass it over to Kendra uh, to share a little bit about the work she's been doing. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Candice. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Kendra Godwin. I came to this program with uh, certain goals for myself, and since arriving, I've noted that a good portion of the early fellowship months just involved wrapping my mind around what is done and what is possible in our field. And uh, for me, it was important to select spring projects that would provide a solid foundation for future work opportunities, introduce me to new concepts and skills, and help me engage with people both within and outside of NLM. I found these qualities in the projects I selected as one looks at issues of usability surrounding a data discovery index, and the other aims to define the scope of open science. These are more specifically titled in their reports as Enhancing the Findability of Datasets, a Status Report on Data Med Usability, and Assessing the Scope of Open Science, Meeting, Applications, and Benefits for the Biomedical Enterprise. I'll spend the next few minutes giving these projects some context and further details. 
I was attracted to my first project because the proposal listed the overall goal as enhancing familiarity and skill in one aspect of data science, and this is an area I very much want to develop. I was also interested because while I was aware of NIH's Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, or BD2K, I was not familiar with the specifics of who or what was funded, and BioCaddy was one of those groups. For project context, BioCaddy, or the Biomedical and Healthcare Data Discovery Index ecosystem, is a team led by individuals at UC San Diego and UT Health at Houston. BD2K charged BioCaddy with the delivery of a functioning prototype of a data discovery index, or DDI. The requirements of this DDI, named DataMed, are that it facilitates three things for researchers the discovery, sharing, and reuse of biomedical data. In conversations with my project sponsor at the start of this project, I found it helpful to distill the project down to one question. How can BioCaddy improve usability and function before DataMed's final launch in August? I've included here a recent screenshot of the DataMed interface to give you a sense of what its landing page looks like and what I've been involved with in the last six months. In the words of the BioCaddy team, DataMed is designed to be, for data, what PubMed has been for the scientific literature. Part of BioCaddy's strategy was to work with the community to test and integrate what they develop and to involve end users with evaluation to inform DataMed's development. I was tasked with reviewing BioCaddy's implementation of usability recommendations, assessing DataMed usability, and making new recommendations from usability principles and user expectations. This project gave me the opportunity to learn from the BioCaddy team uh, to conduct informational interviews, participate in user testing, and further involve myself in research and assessment. My second project is an investigation of open science. I was attracted to this project because it emerged in response to NLM's strategic planning process, and I knew this would involve me with fascinating people. A key aspect of strategic planning concerns the role of NLM in advancing open science, and in initial conversations with my project sponsor, we boiled the project down to the question you see here. What evidence is available to build a case for the value of open science and NLM's role in advancing it. I found that it can be difficult to distill or define open science, um, hence my use of Foster's open science taxonomy tree here, which I find really helpful for framing. A critical part of this project was just that. How can you further something you can't define? I found that open science isn't a well-defined term with a singular definition, but rather a fluid concept with fundamental characteristics and issues. This project uh, has honed my skills in information gathering and summation, and the most interesting part being interviews I conducted with 10 thought leaders in the fields of open science, open policy, data science, data, and librarianship. The outcome of this project is a briefing memo on open science that will inform NLM leadership of open science characteristics, examples, and, and recommendations, and I'm very curious to see uh, where this all goes. So hopefully uh, this has given you a taste for a year within our program and has inspired you to apply to be perhaps an NLM associate fellow, scheme on various ideas or projects, or maybe look into being a host for a second year. The strength of the NLM Associate Fellowship Program is that there's space and staff support to gain experience in any area of interest. While uh, we all had different projects and experiences, we noted that there were some similarities as well. The four of us all worked on projects that involved connecting and communicating ideas and services, assessing the value and the why of operations, and thinking about the future needs of the profession. It's been a wonderful privilege to work here and to have, the ac have access to the opportunities of this year. And we look forward to, to taking what we've learned and this work beyond NLM. Uh, we selected this collage of photos in closing as we felt our experience couldn't be encapsulated in just one image and uh, we wanted to highlight the rich history of this institution and the people within it. It was taken from a recent Circulating Now blog post about a new illustrated history of NLM published as part of the series Images of America. 
to read the article and um, access the freely available ebook, I'll ask Tony now to post the link in the chat box. And at this point, we are done with our presentation, and we would love to hear from our guests. Um, the four of us can answer any questions you have about the program, the year, or our projects. Feel free to enter them now, uh, those questions, into the chat box, and Tony will read them out. Um, thank you, Megan, Kendra, Candace, and Tyler for your presentations. Um, Terry has a question. Um, it's been a while since I did drug searches regularly. Can you explain in plain language what pharco, uh, pharmacovigilance is? Yeah, hi, so this is Candace. Um, I'm assuming that that's directed at me. Um, so pharmacovigilance is uh, really the process of monitoring um, when drugs have interactions with a person who's taking them um, in a way that's not planned for um, or is not doing what it's designed to do when it's causing problems. Um, and so the pharmacovigilance monitoring piece is when um, either the drug manufacturers or the folks at FDA are keeping an eye on um, incident reports when things don't go right. Um, and so the goal with monitoring the published literature is to see um, during clinical trials work, uh, articles are written up all the time about the different stages of the trial. Um, and ideally, we'd be able to uh, pull out any indications um, of warning signs, um, early signal detection um, of things that are popping up in the trial phase before it makes it all the way to having um, a poor impact on someone in the general public. Um, if we can catch it earlier, then we can hopefully mitigate the issue. Um, that's my uh, best attempt at answering that. <laughs> oh, thank you, Terry. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's good to be reminded that um, not everyone is familiar with that, and uh, having an explanation at the ready is, is good. Um, while others are thinking of questions, I'll try and throw out, throw out maybe one myself. Uh, sure. With the program ending, um, where are you guys headed towards after the fellowship is over? Uh, so while I'm still unmuted, this is Candace still, um, so just in general, some of us are heading into second years of the program, and some of us are seeking employment opportunities. Um, I'm happy to chat about mine. I'll let the others decide what they're comfortable sharing. Um, my plan is to be over at the NIH Clinical Center Library for the year, um, where I'm having the opportunity to work with uh, the bibliometrics folks there um, and really continue on with some of the introductory work that's come up in my spring projects um, and get a little bit more uh, specialized skill in that regard. Um, and I'll let the others chime in if they feel moved. And hi, this is uh, Kendra, and I will be going next year for the second year of the fellowship to NYU's Health Sciences Library. And uh, while there, um, they've given me the title Research and Data Librarian. I will predominantly be, do, be uh, working on projects with the data services team and um, the research team there. Hello, this is Tyler Moses. So I'm actually going to be heading over to um, Emory University in Atlanta, where I will be working with Sandra Franklin in the medical library. We're, hope, we're hoping to do an assessment project in where we will evaluate the products and services that they currently have to see whether they're meeting the goals and needs of the students and as well as other constituents. And then if they're not, to see what gaps there are that needs to be filled. All right, and this is Megan. Um, I will not be doing a second year, um, but I am headed down to 
the Raleigh, North Carolina area, and I'm looking at um, academic library positions that allow me to focus on um, instruction and outreach um, to user groups. Terry asks and says um, that she's curious about what the second year consists of um, for those of you that are participating in the second year. Okay, hi, so this is Candace jumping back in for just a second. Um, so I think the best way to sum that up is that it's a chance for the fellows to go into a working library um, where we'll be able to interact with uh, a more specific population. So NLM is awesome in that it serves uh, basically the entire country as its user base. Um, and so it's just an opportunity for us to get a different set of experiences. And um, it's also very heavily project focused. So we will have specialized projects that we're working on, much like the second half of this year. Um, it continues our leadership development and exposure to running different types of libraries. Um, yeah, and if anyone else from the group wants to chime in and add on, feel free. Yeah, this, uh, this is Kendra, and so I, what I, probably reiterating what Candace has already said, but what I think is great is when you go into the second year, you know, you've had the chance to talk to your preceptor, which tends to be the director of that library. They've connected you with staff, and I feel like there's a lot of support both from um, Kethel Dunn at NLM and at the, the future site to really develop things that you find would be most interesting to yourself and to, to build on the skills um, for the, you know, the position and the profession that you will be having um, after the second year is completed. So it seems like at this point, <laughs> without having started the second year, that there is um, a lot of opportunity um, to be flexible and to find um, things of interest. Kelsa asks, are the projects proposed by staff members at NLM matched to fellows' skills and interests prior to starting them? Hello, uh, this, this is Tyler. So the projects that staff members often propose, some it can be um, crafted specifically for an NLM fellow. So like in Candace's situation, um, part of one of her projects was she got to talk with a staff member that was interested in the, the same in the area that she was interested in and they were able to kind of work together to craft a project. Um, but oftentimes, a lot of the staff members will put forth projects that they hope to interest the, the, the fellows. Sometimes they do look at our bios, which go up on the website and will propose projects um, that align to our interests, but oftentimes it, they do put forth projects that they, that they wish to have a fellow work on. So it, it can vary, it can be based on the interest, but also sometimes it's just based off of things that they really would want a fellow to work on with them, or they feel like that would interest the fellow. Yeah, Kendra here, just to kind of um, tag on to that. Uh, I think it's great to, um, we covered this a little bit in the webinar we did um, halfway through our year, but uh, I think it's fantastic to sort of see without solicitation, like what is important to NLM at the time and what um, interests the different divisions and, and what's kind of going on in the world of librarianship to, to go into the job jar, which is um, what we use to, uh, for people to post things and for us to look at them. And, and it's always interesting to see like what's going on because we could have a specific skill or, or interest but not actually be aware that this is an opportunity. So it's really a great time to, to engage and, and, and learn more. Jessica has a question for Megan specifically. For your project with PubMed and cancer researchers, um, has it inspired a possible standard instructional training or other ways to assist this population in making the most of PubMed for their searches? Sure, so that's a really good question um, and something that I have been thinking about as I'm analyzing my focus group and survey data. Um, and the answer for that right now is that um, I'll be um, creating a set of recommendations to share with NLM's PubMed training team. 
Um, keeping in mind that I did have a relatively small sample size for my focus groups, and having talked with cancer researchers only on the NIH campus, you know, we can't know for sure um, if they're representative of cancer researchers as a whole. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, the next steps of my project will be to give recommendations to the PubMed training team um, for particular areas um, that I have found um, where the cancer researchers um, would benefit from instruction, and then also providing um, some next steps um, if they were to continue with further research, um, needs assessment of this user group, um, what I would recommend, whether that's a survey of the larger NCI community or outside of NLM. Um, so as an outcome of my project at this stage, um, no standard instructional training yet, um, but I'm hoping that there will be some um, definite benefits of this in terms of training for not only cancer researchers, but ways that we approach training for um, other groups as well at NLM. So I'll take a couple more minutes to see if there are any additional questions. Um, while that's happening, I would probably um, have one more question is, um, what is one of the most eye-opening things that you've um, discovered or learned about NLM that you will take with you um, in the future as librarians? Anyone? Okay, so this is Candace again, just to, to kick us off, give everyone else a minute to think up their responses, but I think for me it's really been um, about the people here and just how genuinely enthusiastic they are about the work that they do here and the products that they develop and the services that they offer and how responsive they are to questions internally and externally. So. Um, when folks contact them through whatever channels are relevant um, for the for the product or area that they work in. Um, they just have such great depth of insight and experience with the things that they're working on and are so open about sharing that with folks. And it's just wonderful to see something that I think epitomizes librarianship uh, on such uh, wonderful display on an ongoing basis, and it's something that I look forward to taking with me when I leave here, is that uh, reassurance that should I come up with any uh, questions or roadblocks about an NLM product or service in the future, um, I can always reach back directly to the source and get that support. Um, that's That's been the thing for me. Hi, this is Tyler. So I would like to say, it, it, I would say yes, I reiterate what Candace said, that the, the meeting the, keep the people here and also establishing a network and just learning of the wealth of everything that they do here has really been a great benefit. Um, another thing that really, I, for me personally, is with all, this, all the talk around data science and big data is that hearing conversations and engaging with various groups, both here at NLM as well as other health science, li health science libra libraries, it really helped me to see that what data science is kind of almost intuitive for each individual library and, and for each individual field. So the way data science can be incorporated into particular areas and aspects of medical librarianship can be vastly different for, for each and every group. And so just kind of hearing the talks, and especially with um, my idea, my goal is to create more self-sustaining outreach, seeing how what I can do possibly in fitting data science within that has really been, for me, an eye-opening experience for it, because with, with like what Ken just was saying with her project, the idea of like open science and all these terms are so big, it's kind of hard to see like how it, where it fits within your field, but all these talks have really helped me kind of feel how data science can really fit within my professional interests. 
And this is Kendra here. Um, what I have found really kind of eye-opening and inspiring is uh, seeing Patty Brennan um, come into the library and the various opportunities that we've had to be in, in meetings at like the Board of Regents meeting or some of the strategic planning that was surrounding um, data science, open science, and uh, biomedical informatics here at the library. Um, something that I want to take with me on to my next year and into um, my career is just the, the powerful way of kind of storytelling and communicating your mission. And um, in my open science project, I had the opportunity to talk with 10 different people about open science. And it's always interesting to see, you know, what people do or don't know about the library. And um, I, I knew, a, a, you know, that the NLM is sort of, you know, the mothership for so many things. But to really be here and engage with uh, people both within and outside of the library uh, kind of has given me a renewed or just actually this entirely new sense of um, what we do here and what we uh, can accomplish when we kind of develop these these great kind of trans network um, communications and initiatives. So um, really just kind of want to take all these ideas and all these people with me and, and keep doing really uh, interesting work. And this is Megan. I think um, it's, it's hard to talk what everyone else said, um, but something that's really um, inspired me this year is seeing the amount of collaboration that happens here. It is a very large library of about 1,700 um, staff, um, and there are people working here in various disciplines. You know, it's not just librarians. We have computer scientists and physicians and um, people educated in all different disciplines, and we work together um, to solve problems and to collaborate, um, and that's kind of spoken to me, um, knowing that going forward into academic libraries, um, keeping this open-mindedness to work with people um, who have different backgrounds for me um, is something that I will bring. Jessica asks, based on the projects you all worked on and your knowledge of NLM's future directions, do you have any predictions of future projects that will be proposed to future fellows? Uh, this is Kendra. I feel obligated to say something here, but with a great disclaimer that um, none of us have a crystal ball. Um, but in a lot of my conversations with people um, revolving around open science, uh, we tend, my project sponsor and I who, who conducted the interviews, we would ask at the end what people's uh, recommendations are for furthering open science, both at NLM and NIH. And, um, you know, granted so much of everything in life, especially in the sciences, comes down to, to time and to funding and, and personnel, but I think a, a really strong um, direction for NLM, if all goes according to plan, um, my plan, of course, once again, disclaimer, uh, would be involving training and, um, and uh, training and, and data science and how can we, you know, merge these future directions with uh, more traditional librarianship and, you know, what do, what does a future librarian look like? So um, that's not exactly project specific, but um, we'll see if any of the other fellows wanted to say something about this. Hi, Jessica. This is Tyler. Um, so once again, as Kendra said, I don't really have a crystal ball, so I can't really say for sure that this would be in the future. Um, just through my talk, my talks with my project regarding the children's in, and also with other some um, professionals in both medical librarianship as well as talking with some um, professionals from the AMIA conference, there does seem to be a growing interest in doing a lot more cross-collaboration, um, so not just like within other departments, but also working with people from various other fields to kind of create a more comprehensive approach to certain aspects of their work. Um, again, I'm not sure how this would, this is just my 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 opinion based off of what I've heard in my conversations, um, probably would be maybe more, also possibly data, learning about more about data science and also what type of, how it fits within other aspects within medical librarianship. 
um, that those are kind of the two things that really kind of come to mind just based off of discussions I've had with, uh, with other professionals here at NLM and, and other parts of the medical library field. But again, I, it's really hard to crystallize and say something specific as to if that would be particularly something that would be put cause future projects or if that would in turn cause into being proposed to fellows as projects. Okay, and one quick chime in from me. This is Candace again. Um, I would also say um, in terms of future project opportunities that so much of what gets proposed is going to be based off of the fellow's interests. Um, they're going to take that into account. And as someone who uh, solicited proposals for two of my three projects, um, I can say that that is a big contributing factor. Staff want the opportunity to work with us. They want to see what ideas are uh, fresh and resonating with us as young new professionals, um, and so put some good thought into what um, what you might like to work on that uh, is unique to this environment that you wouldn't be able to do anywhere else, and then talk to the people who could help make it happen. Um, that's been, again, tying back to one of the things that was really eye-opening for me is um, just how interested and engaged everyone is and how willing people have been to step up and create opportunities once we were able to express interest in it. Um, and I think that that's been a great part of the satisfaction that I've felt by participating in the program. Um, that's, that's just me. Um, yeah. All right. Oh, I, sorry, Tony. I apologize. Kendra, I think we're almost out of time. Do you want to move on to the last slide? Yes. So um, I will move on now. And this is our, is our thank you slide. So um, we wanted to thank all of you for joining and for your questions. And um, if, obviously, if, if others come up, um, please feel free to reach out to us. I've got all of our NIH emails listed here. Um, and if other, you know, curiosities or collaborations come to mind, email those as well. So, um, yeah, thank you to the NNLM Southeast Atlantic Region for having us on, um, and to Ashley Kufia specifically for first reaching out about doing this, and obviously to um, Tony to, uh, for your support today and uh, over the last few weeks. So um, I'm going to hand things back to him now. Um, have a fantastic rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for joining. So I want to thank everyone um, that was able to join us today. Uh, the webinar was recorded, and I apologize, I think I missed the first five minutes, um, but that was mostly the introduction. Um, and it will be posted on the NLM YouTube page at a later date. Um, if you haven't subscribed to that, you are welcome to do so. And I have pasted the URL to the NNLM YouTube page so you can get updates regarding um, when new um, presentations have been up, uploaded to the site. Um, I am going to paste um, in the chat box as well um, the evaluation link, which is to survey Gizmo. So to evaluate today's webinar and to receive an MLA course code that you would use um, in MedLibEd to claim your um, MLA contact hours, please use the link that I had shared earlier. Um, thank you everyone for uh, thank you everyone for attending today's Beyond the Sea webinar. Our next webinar in this series is scheduled on October 4th at 2 p.m., where we will have a guest speaker present on instructional design. Um, thank you everyone, and have a great rest of the day.